God is good. I want to share with you a, a, a message this morning entitled, Stay Awake. Stay Awake. I was in Royal Rangers till I turned 12. Most of you probably know what Royal Rangers is. It's the Assemblies of God version of the Boy Scouts. Uh, my opinion, better, but uh, I, I'm just... I'm biased, but whatever. And you've probably heard me talk about it before, even saying that I wasn't a very good Royal Ranger, primarily because I'm not outdoorsy. Uh, and, and the Royal Rangers, they're all the time outdoors. Uh, however, I remember nearly everything that I ever learned from the Royal Rangers. And I remember, and I'm actually, I've got it up here. I, I hope you see it. I remember the, the Royal Ranger emblem. And, and, and what it stood for, in, in fact, there's, there's the four gold points that represent the four ways a boy grows. They're mentally, physically, spiritually, and socially. There's the four red points, which are the four main teachings or the four core beliefs of the church. Salvation, Holy Spirit, healing, uh, or, or excuse me, baptism in the Holy Spirit, divine healing, and the second coming of Jesus, also known as the rapture of the church. Uh, and then there's the eight blue points of the Royal Ranger <coughs> code, which is uh, alert. Uh, and, and side note, I heard an interesting, um, kind of a funny uh, along the, that I was told this week when my, uh, when my dad was in the National Guard, um, they had a, uh, a, a phrase that they used and, and it was regarding the word alert. And it said, be alert because the world needs a lot more alerts. I'd never heard that and thought it was funny. Almost had a wreck with ice cream in my hand this week when I heard it. No, I'm kidding. It wasn't. It was funny. But uh, uh, the the eight blue points of the Royal Ranger Code: to be alert, to be clean, to be honest, to be courageous, to be loyal, to be courteous, to be obedient, and to be spiritual. Those are the eight blue points of the Royal Ranger Code. And then, of course, probably the most important thing that I remember is the Royal Ranger motto. And some of you are going to remember this, but over the years they have whittled it down because it used to be ready, ready for anything, ready to work, play, serve, obey, worship, live, and they even put et cetera, which is like that, that, that one word that just kind of encompasses everything else that's not listed out. But they have changed it to where it is one singular word, and that singular word is ready. So the Royal Ranger motto now is ready. And the word ready here, and, and I, I want us to, to focus on this, because the focus of, of the motto has always been that one word, ready, yet we had this long motto to define it. And, and the word ready is defined as fully prepared. Fully prepared. It implies that the ready person has taken into account all the angles, all the possibilities uh, that might occur within an activity that they are participating in. And, and, and so uh, as I was thinking about this stay awake and as I kind of felt like the Lord was leading me in a particular direction, uh, I don't. it's kind of funny that God would remind me that I was a Royal Ranger once um, because I've kind of put that in the in the history documents of my life. Uh, but you know that the, the New Testament is filled with opportunities to heed the word of the Royal Ranger motto, that word ready. And one such place is found in the Gospel of Mark chapter 13. You can go there if you want to. Uh, John, or excuse me, Mark chapter 13, Jesus had just finished telling the disciples that the temple would be faced with a time where one stone would not be upon another. Peter, James, and John, and even Andrew come to Jesus privately. You can find this in uh, the beginning of chapter 13 there in Mark. They come to him and they, they, they ask him privately, when will this happen? And, and they, they ask what the sign will be when all these things are about to be accomplished. One of the Gospels says that they ask him what will be the sign of the end of the age. Uh, and can I, can I pause for just a second and say that, that this message that I want to share with you, that I want to encourage you with, that I want to challenge you with, is in light of the fact of the, the, the times that we are living in. 
And you'll understand what I'm talking about here in just a few minutes, but it just seems to me that the more news that comes out, the more failures in the pulpit that come out, uh, the, the more churches that are being destroyed, the more Christians that are showing up and not necessarily being truly Christ-like, the more it just seems like there's some stuff going on in the world and, it's, and, and the church, rather than being light, is surrendering to what's going on in the world. And, and there just seems to be this call. It, it may be subtle. It may be uh, not, not a, a super loud uh, call. But if you, um, if you have the spiritual hearing of a dog that can hear pitches that none of us in our humanity can actually hear, then you understand that there is a cry that's going out from heaven. And he is speaking to the church. And while we've been so focused on the signs of the times, we've missed something that Jesus says. And so Jesus is, it goes into this explanation with his disciples. What will the, the sign of the times be? When will these things be accomplished? Jesus answers them. He says, man, beware of false teachers. How many of you know that there are some false teachers that are out there? Now, I want you to understand the difference between a false teacher and somebody who just doesn't teach it right. Okay, somebody who doesn't teach it right is, not, is somebody who reads a scripture, maybe reads a little too much into the scripture. A false teacher is someone who preaches something that is not Jesus at all. Okay, so there's a difference between somebody just for whatever reason they took a scripture out of context. That's not a false teacher, that's a mistake. Jesus says there's going to be false teachers who are going to come around saying, I am Messiah, I am super anointed, I am these things. And they're going to create a following that will mimic the discipleship of Jesus. And that's where the falseness is. It's not in people's mistaken taking scriptures and, and saying dumb things with it. He not only said that, but he said that there will be wars and rumors of wars. In case you haven't seen it, war is going on around the world. It's not just wars in the natural. It's kingdoms coming against kingdoms. We have spiritual war that is also going on. There is a spiritual war in the area of religion. There's a spiritual war in the area of acceptance and sin and, it's, and, and whether things are sin anymore or not. There's a war, a spiritual war that's going on regarding scripture. So it's not just, it's not just the, the president of Ukraine and the president of Russia that don't like each other. It's bigger than that. But that's going on in the world. Jesus says you would hear of these things. He said there would be earthquakes in various places and famines. Come on, people. Earthquakes in various places. Not just shaking the earth itself, but some earthquakes being felt so powerfully in the earth's crust that waves are created that bring more destruction than the earthquake could. Okay, so there's stuff that's going on. Jesus said there would be earthquakes in various places. There would be famines. That these are the beginnings, he says, of birth pains. He didn't say labor. Labor can take hours. Birth is different. It implies labor. But the beginnings of birth pains, when, it re when the pushing really starts to happen, ladies and gentlemen... That's where we're at. That, that's the birth pain. He gives natural signs. He says there will be signs in the heavens above and in the earth beneath. There will be all of these things. And finally gets to the most exciting part. He says this, the Son of Man will appear coming in the clouds. I, I, I can tell you we're to the point where if we would look to the sky, there's not a cloud in the sky that I don't go, Jesus, you can come out of that one. Those aren't dark clouds. Either Those are clouds of joy and clouds of happiness and, 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 and fluffy clouds. It's like, oh, uh, you ever seen those sunsets where the way the sun shines through the clouds, there's just rays of sunshine. And you go, oh, Jesus, if you could just pick a, a picture to come out of, that would be the one right there. So, so there's, this, there's this understanding in our hearts that we're, we're winding down. We're getting to the point. 
Things are starting to move rapidly. Time is moving ever faster and faster and faster and faster. We, lost, we, we fell back last night. And some of you still look like you lost an hour of sleep. <laughs> Time just keeps on ticking. It keeps on going. Days feel shorter. Nights feel shorter. Everything is happening and we're ramping ourselves up so we know we who are alive by the Spirit of God know that Jesus is just literally on the horizon. He, he's on the horizon. And, and so uh, join with me in that. All things we have preached about over the years in pulpits all across the world. We have conferences on end time signs. We pay thousands of dollars to hear in a conference what preachers have been preaching since Jesus went up to heaven. That he was co that he's coming soon. But then at the end he gives this bit of encouraging instruction that we find in verses 32 through 37 of Mark chapter 13. Here's what it says. But concerning that day, this is a bummer, but this is why we get excited. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, that means in light of what he just said, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or when the cock crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep and what I say to you, I say to all. Stop for a second. Jesus peeled back the future. He wasn't just speaking to the twelve. He wasn't just speaking to the four that asked him. He's not just speaking to the 120 in the upper room and the 500 that, that truly said they were followers of Jesus. He's speaking to me and you Whosoever the Lord our God shall call to salvation through the blood of Jesus. He's talking to you today, church. Jesus says this 2,000 years ago. Stay awake. And so, four times, Jesus gives this command to stay awake. This is critical, and it's the point to take home today because here's what it was. To remain ready, to be fully prepared, ladies and gentlemen, you must stay awake. To be ready, you must stay awake. Jesus put those two together. What he wants you to understand, he says this to all of us, in light of what he says to the doorman, we've got to understand you are all. Doormen, not dormant, doormen. You are all doormen. He speaks to his disciples, to all of us, the readers of the gospel, the future church that is today. A doorman very simply minds the door. Isn't it interesting that David in one of his psalms says, I would rather be a doorman in the house of God. I would rather have the menial task of opening and closing a door in the house of God than to spend a thousand years anywhere else. Your presence means so much more to me. I would, I, and so we think David whittles it down to a simple job, but he determined, listen, the doorman determined who was allowed in and who was not. If he didn't open the door, it was not going to be opened. Now listen to that. Hear the importance of that word. If the doorman did not open the door, it was not going to be opened. Whether it was guests, family, or business, he was the one who opened the door and shut the door. 
He also was the one who ensured that whenever the master returned and announced his return, that he was available and ready to open the door for him. The doorman sets the tone for his return. Hear that. Church, we're doormen. We set the tone for his return. The world does not set the tone. The economy does not set the tone. The president does not set the tone. The wars don't set the tone. Those are symbols. Those are things that are going to happen. But how the church responds sets the tone for the return of Jesus. That's why he says, you're a doorman. Do we worship with expectation in the tone that, in the tone that we set? Do we worship with expectation? Listen, do we worship with expectation that Jesus himself in his body is even here? Listen, if worship becomes hollow, it's because Jesus isn't here. And if Jesus is here, then we need to worship like he's here. Instead of waiting to create an invitation for him. Because if this is his house, he's already here. I don't, listen, I may be the only person who says, hey, I've got something I left on my kitchen table. My door's unlocked. You can go in anytime you want to, whether I'm there or not. I know I do that. And I know I just put that on Facebook. We're going to edit that out now. I'm <laughs> But I'm pretty sure when Jesus makes an invitation, he has a point of being there when he makes the invitation. So Jesus doesn't invite you to his house without the fact that he's going to be present. So if we walk through the doors of this church and we sense that Jesus isn't here, then this is not his house. Wow. Wow. Do we worship with the expectation, not just that he is here, knowing that he is here, but that when he walks in, when Jesus walks into the room, what happens? Everything's supposed to change, isn't it? I mean, when Jesus walks into the room, all bets are off. All possibilities are possible. But if Jesus doesn't walk in the room, because we have not created the expectation for him to walk in the room. Because we have created the expectation for him to not even be home. And listen, I'm not talking about the, the, the wood and plaster with the brick on the outside. Listen, if this building had gotten hit by tornadoes on Friday, we would have still had church somewhere because this is not the church. You are. And the moment you stop worshiping this building like it's something special, God will begin to move. We take care of the building, absolutely, but it's a building. We are the body, the temple. Open the doors and see all the people. You know, isn't that funny? Hey, here's the church, here's the steeple. And if we just stayed here, then it would be okay. You'd be justified in saying the building is important, but you've got to open the door. The doorman sets the tone. Do we worship with expectation? Let me ask you this question. Are we opening the door of salvation to those who need in? Or are we handpicking who can and cannot? We set the, we're doormen. We set the tone. The doorman who is also the bride sets the atmosphere for the master, for the groom to arrive and enter. Listen, by creating an expectation, being a doorkeeper is not just in terms of his physical return to the earth as a matter of end times prophetic reality, but it is also in the sense of Sunday after Sunday when the congregation gets together. Listen, you come into this place and you are all the doorman who opens the door for the king to come in. You are all opening the door of salvation to those who need it. You are opening the door of healing to those who need it. You are opening the door of restoration to those who need it because you are a doorman who's guarding the presence. Guardians of the presence. We're 
guardians with the instruction to stay awake. Stay awake. Stay awake. Secondly, not only are you a doorman, but this is, this is, what, requ- this is what is required of you. You've got to stay close to the Father. Listen, Jesus twice belittles himself. Now, understand I'm saying this tongue in cheek because Jesus would not belittle himself. But Jesus one time was, was asked as good rabbi and he says, don't ask, don't tell me I'm good. There is none good but the Father. Jesus includes himself in that statement. And then right here, Jesus says, only the Father knows. He hasn't even told the Son. That doesn't mean that Jesus walks in ignorance. Jesus isn't ignorant, but even Jesus doesn't know. That's why you've always had the dramatics of the pastor saying, Jesus is standing at the throne of the Father and he's saying, can I go, can I go, can I go, when can I go, when can I go? The only reason that Jesus does that is because the Father has not said to him, go. But Jesus understood the times of when it was possible that he could come. But only the Father gives permission. That lets you know that Jesus surrendered to the Father. He trusted the Father. Even with his return, he trusted the Father. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to trust the Father. Listen, I am all about having the knowledge and having the understanding. I'm all about studying it out and, and, and looking into it. And, and who knows, that when uh, January rolls around and we start to pick apart another book of the Bible on Wednesday nights, we might just teach something that's end times, revelation. I don't know, Daniel, I'm talking to him about teaching it. I don't know if he will or not, but... You know, we're trying to do something uh, that's, that's possible just so people have a knowledge and understanding because there's so much confusion. There's so much confusion. But here's the thing. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. So whether we study Revelation to look at signs of the times or not, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of the King of Kings. It's always and always will be about Jesus. So if we're going in to get head knowledge and not lift up Jesus, you shouldn't do it. But this is what has happened. We get into end times and we talk about all of the signs and we're throwing our knowledge of the signs and the, and the wisdom and the, and the headlines and the, and the dates and the, and the people and who we think is going to be the Antichrist. And some people think it was Obama. That was a lie. Some people think it's the Pope. I don't know who it is. All I know is the Bible tells me that when he rears his ugly head, I'm not going to be here. Because once he shows up, it's all about Israel. It's no longer about me. Because there is still a people group on this earth that is yet to be redeemed and they are the apple of God's eye. And so until we understand, yes, that's why I believe that the rapture takes place and the church is lifted up before all hell breaks loose on the earth. Because how else is a stiff-necked Israel going to find out who the Messiah is until we who know the Messiah are out of the way? So I want you to hear, yes, this is what I believe. Whether you agree with me or not is beside the point because if you're not about Jesus and if you're just about your facts and figures, don't talk to me. Because we're at the place where it's about Jesus and we're lifting Jesus higher and higher. And so when all these, the, only the Father knows when these things will happen. He's the, the one who knows when all these things will come to a point. Sticking close to the Father is having a listening ear to his voice. Responding when he speaks in obedience and awe. Responding to the Father. Listen, it's real hard to move in a service when you're not listening to where the Father wants to go. It's real hard to surrender worship when you're not listening to the Father. 
It's real hard to surrender sin when you're not listening to the Father. It's real hard to surrender life when you're not listening to the Father. And so Jesus, while he's saying the Father knows, he's implying that our ear sticks close to Daddy. Because Daddy is who you trust. Mm. Daddy is who you trust. It's, it's interesting, you know, all of the storms and stuff that were going on the other, the other day. And, and over the years, you know, my kids. Uh, Stacy and I are just bad enough that we would have watched Twister the other night. Okay. Even though they were all, all around us, we could have chased one if we'd have wanted to. Which I did when we were first married, by the way. It, it's pretty stupid what I was doing, but I did it anyway. Um, but, you know, there's this point where I had to finally look at, at, at my daughter specifically. Because anytime you use the T word in a storm, panic ensues. Look at the clouds, look at the wind, look at the rain, look at the way the trees are, are reacting to the wind. Look at this. Those trees are really hanging low right now, Dad. Do you hear the siren? Sounds like there's a train going by the house outside. You know, all, all of the things, the wonder and awe of what we have told people a tornado sounds like. But I'll go outside and then I'll come back in and I look my daughter in the eye and I say, Look, is Daddy worried? Because if Daddy's not worried, you don't need to worry. Come on, church, if we would just listen to the Father with that intent. If Daddy's not concerned, you don't have to be. Come on, that'll preach. That'll probably preach, and that, that's a whole other message in and of itself. But above all, it's trust. Trusting in his timing. Trusting in his direction. But that pathway looks dark. That pathway looks painful. It's about his return. Stay awake. Walk the path. Oh, trust the Father. He knows where he's sending you. He knows what he's empowered you and enabled you with. He has anointed you and appointed you for just this time right here and now. Trust in his provision when it looks like there is none. I serve a God who can tell someone to throw a hook in some water and find a fish to pay taxes. So I'm telling you right now, we serve a God who can handle business without our help, okay? So I, I, I trust in the Father, trust in His provision, trust in His awareness. And above all, if we are bringing and opening the door and creating the atmosphere of His presence, then trust in His presence. Four times Jesus says, stay awake. So lastly, you've got to hear this. Don't get lulled to sleep. Don't get lulled to sleep. <coughs> Don't get lulled to sleep by the church gathering together as an option. I, I, I need. I want you to hear this. I understand a day that takes you out. I understand a time that you can't come to church. But I need you to hear that online service was never intended to take the place of personal presence together with the body of Christ. In fact, online service was created for those who are church shopping. It's created for those who are like, well, I wonder what that church is like. Did you know that churches with, that if you have an online presence, if you have a, a streaming service and all of that, they are watching you weeks before they ever walk through the door. That's why you record your services. That's why you put them on Facebook. That's why you have those things. But COVID came in. And scared the body of Christ. And the real kept coming. And the lost have excused themselves away from coming. Now, I know there's people that are not here today. And I'm not trashing on you for not being here. But you need to be here. There is strength in numbers. 
there is something about not, that this Paul even says, do not forsake the assembling of the brethren together as some have. Now listen to what he says. Not only have they forsaken the assembly, but they've turned their back on God. Listen, that's the importance of being together as a body. Coming together and experiencing presence together. There is something important and vital. But if all we do is we decide, oh, I don't want to go to church today. I can just watch you online. We're in danger of falling asleep. Because the more you treat online as an option the more you grow numb to the presence of God. The more you grow numb to the voice of God. The more you grow numb to the power of the word. The more you grow numb to the spirit of God moving. The more you grow numb to what God's wanting to do. He's where he's calling, what he's leading. You become numb to those things and it's the same as being asleep. Well, I'm going to preach myself happy or preach myself out of a job. I don't know what's going to happen. Listen, I can't shy away from it, but isn't it interesting that just 15 years ago, the option of the church gathering together to worship on Sundays was almost a necessity. I grew up. Well, some, to some of you, I may not be grown up yet, but I grew up. With the understanding that it didn't matter how late I stayed out the night before. It didn't matter what I did that Saturday night. I could, who I was with, how far away from home I was. It didn't matter any of those things. What mattered was at 8 o'clock in the morning, wake up, throw your clothes on. Now it got worse because all of a sudden I became a part of the worship team that practiced at 8 o'clock in the morning. So it became 7 but without fail. And then here's what's crazy. They gave me keys and responsibility to unlock the doors of the church. Which meant 630. <laughs> but y'all understand the point was it doesn't matter what you did. You're going to church. So is it safe to say that we've become rebellious because we treat it as an option? Oh, I'm all, I, I make my own decisions now. Look, I get that. The moment I got married and got out of my house, uh, my parents' house, I was making my own decisions. But can I be honest and tell you that I was raised in such a way that not being at church makes me feel lost even when I'm on vacation and have the right to not have to go to church on a Sunday. But I feel like I have missed out on a connection when I'm not there. And it's like, oh God, I'll go and I'm not even taking church clothes with me. And I'm having to force myself on vacation to not go anywhere because if I'm not careful, I would go, I miss, I miss the body. I miss, I miss the body. I, I miss the body. Oh, well, you're a pastor. You're supposed to feel that way. So are you. If you're a part of the body of Christ, he's not separated into who's more important and should have a greater longing. We're all a part of it. And so we were, I was raised with that. And so, I, I, you know, I, you want to instill that. <laughs> we can't expect Jesus to come to our house when we don't feel like joining him at his. We can't put Jesus on call like that. And I got to keep on going. We can't get lulled to sleep by current events. I'm just as irritated with where our country is going as the next person. I watch TV and I'm frustrated. I see what the world is saying is good and evil. I see sin being lifted up. I see the way of the world. I see what the world is thinking and what the world is saying. And I begin to see the church starting to agree with points 
that the world is making. And understand something. I'm not talking about devaluing a person. Because if I'm a doorman, I don't devalue people. They all should have the opportunity to receive Jesus. Regardless of how far away they are, the color of their skin, or even their perceived orientation sexually. I'm telling you right now, the power of God is able to change anyone. And so I won't, I, I will not devalue a person or dehumanize an individual. I won't do that. But I see sin being uplifted. And you know what I see when I see sin being uplifted? I see the church apathetic. I see the church not caring anymore. And I'm not talking about writing letters to your congressmen and demanding laws that get that. that. Listen, the disciples, the apostle Paul, Jesus himself worked within the governmental structure that they had, even in its corruption. And they still turned the world upside down. They didn't need special rights and privileges. They didn't need the American way. They didn't need any of those things. They had Jesus Christ, Him crucified, risen again, seated at the right hand of the Father, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Ghost in their lives, laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover, not having to ask permission, going wherever they chose to go and preaching the power of the gospel to whosoever would listen. And even Jesus himself said, whoever listens and repents and believes will be saved. And whoever doesn't listen... You want the hard line? It breaks the heart of Jesus that people walk away from him, but he lets them. Because it wasn't about you keeping them in earshot. It's about them being told and receiving a, 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 the gospel and a, either accepting it or denying it. Well, you're getting all the barrels today. The climate of our world is continuously changing and it is very easy to become jaded when it seems like the world is getting darker and more sinister. And yet we forget that the light we have within us is brighter and exposes darkness. The light of the gospel cannot be absorbed by darkness. It cannot be absorbed by darkness because light reveals darkness. It reveals it. We've got to stop being indifferent and instead be the difference. Here's one. I, I, I need to stop being lulled to sleep in waiting. Everybody says this. We've been preaching for the last hundred years that Jesus was coming and Jesus hasn't come. They've been preaching since Peter stood up in the temple and preached for 10 minutes and 3,000 people got saved. Oh, and Jesus still hasn't returned. And, and all these signs, they continue to repeat themselves. I mean, let's be honest, history repeats itself. It's cyclical. It repeats itself. And oh, all the signs, they keep repeating. Every so many years, we get the same stuff. We get signs in the heavens above and signs in the earth beneath. We have famines and earthquakes and devastation and war after war after war after war and kingdom after kingdom after kingdom after kingdom. And it constantly is in this rotation. It's always happening and we still haven't seen Jesus return. Well, if Jesus really wanted to return, he would. I have to be honest and say that I, I, I have never seen a pregnant woman fall asleep during labor. No, hear it. I've never seen a woman giving birth fall asleep during birth. And yet, these are the beginnings of birth pains.
We've been preaching about the signs of the times, preaching about the return of Jesus, writing book after book, even to the point of attempting to predict his return, and nothing ever comes of it. Because of this, a numbness has grown in the expectation of his return. Nothing ever comes of it. Generation after generation waits and nothing. So why even be concerned with it? This is asleep. Now, listen, Matthew chapter 25, I didn't put it in here because I'm not going to read the whole parable. Matthew chapter 25, the parable of the ten virgins. Listen, the mistake of the five unwise virgins wasn't that they slept. It's that they didn't have full preparation. They weren't ready. Being lulled to sleep in the waiting is not about the physical act of sleep. It's about the negligence of being prepared. Now, hear that again. Being, the, falling asleep is not the physical act of laying your head down on a pillow and sleeping. It's about being negligent in your preparation. They were, uh, they were negligent in their preparation. Therefore, it makes it sound like the sleep is what got them. That's not what got them. Their lamps went out. They had no reserve for lighting the lamp. And they begged to get oil from the other virgins. The wise virgins weren't willing to share because they knew that even though the bridegroom was coming, they needed their supply of oil until they saw him. Sharing the oil may have brightened the path, but the time would have been shortened on how long the welcome was lit. And so they, they, they turn to these five virgins who don't have oil and they say, go into the market and get yourself some oil so that you can come and be prepared with us so that when the time comes, the pathway is completely lit the way it's supposed to be. We don't have time for you to live off of the provision that we alone have. I told you, you're going to get the third barrel. There's no such thing as a three-barrel gun, but you're getting the third one. Church, stop living off of somebody else's oil. I know how much oil your grandparents had and your great-grandparents had. And, and listen, I come from a pedigree that's, that's, that's equal to anyone's, okay? My, 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 my family came in as ministry from, from across the sea. I, I come from the, the roots of Methodism, the original spirit-filled Methodism, not the Methodism that we see today, the spirit-filled Methodism. They came over in the 1700s to a newly birthed country for the hopes of propagating Methodism in the United States at its earliest time from Kentucky westward. That was where, that's where I come from. I come from them coming over in Sweden as Lutherans. I don't know. I don't know anything about Lutheran. But L Well, Luther was cool. He, you know, at least was rebellious to the norm. But so I, I, I you know, the, I come from Lutherans. I come from Charismatics. I come from uh, Pentecostals. I have, I have Pente Pentecostal holiness pedigree. I have, listen, and if all I did was sit back and go, well, my grandma, my great-grandma, my great granddaddy, my great grandpappy, all of these guys all the way back to the coming over on the boat in, to Kentucky had oil. And I live off of that? There will be no light. So get your own oil. Stop living off of yesterday's revival. Brownsville's not going to help you today. The, the outpouring in, in, in Alabama today is not going to help you today. Going to some revival at some church is not the same as you getting oil in preparation yourself. It's not the same. And so the, there was this lack of preparation that they had, this lack in their lives. So listen, just coming to gatherings, giving my tithe and offering is not going to cut it. Where is your oil? Where is your preparation? Where is your ready? Are you staying away? So I close with this. Our ready, our awake becomes stunted simply because we stopped being active in the kingdom. I'm going to conclude with the lyrics from a song. Uh, you've heard it before. The song, While I'm Waiting. And here's what happened to this song. Great song. But all the videos that you watch for this song are from Fireproof.
So everybody thinks that this song is about marriage. The song's not about marriage. It just happened to be a song written at the time Fireproof, which is all about marriage, came out. And so it got linked because of the hero of the story waiting on God to bring healing to his marriage. But the lyrics say nothing about marriage. Listen to the lyrics. I'm waiting. I'm waiting on you, Lord, and I am hopeful. I'm waiting on you, Lord, though it is painful, but patiently I will wait. I'm waiting. I'm waiting on you, Lord, and I am peaceful. I'm waiting on you, Lord, though it's not easy, but faithfully I will wait. Listen, listen, listen to the, 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 the pre-chorus. I will move ahead bold and confident, taking every step in obedience. Sounds like staying awake. While I'm waiting, I will serve you. While I'm waiting, I will worship. While I'm waiting, I will not faint. I'll be running the race even while I wait. Nothing in this song is inactive. It's awakened. It's staying awake. It's being ready. 